Hey folks, welcome to another video in renal physiology. In this section of the renal physiology, we are going to discuss about the countercurrent mechanisms. Countercurrent multiplier. The concentrating mechanism depends on the maintenance of a gradient of increasing osmolality along the medullary pyramids. This gradient is produced by the operation of the loop of Henle as countercurrent multipliers and maintained by the operation of the vasa recta as countercurrent exchangers. A countercurrent system is a system in which the inflow runs parallel to, counter to, and in close proximity to the outflow for some distance. This occurs for both the loops of Henle and the vasa recta in the renal medulla. By this process, solutes, principally sodium chloride, is reabsorbed without water from the ascending limb of the loop of Henle into the surrounding medullary interstitium. This decreases the osmolality in the tubular fluid and raises the osmolality of the interstitium at this point. The increased osmolality of the interstitium then causes water to be reabsorbed from the descending limb of the loop of Henle, thus increasing the tubular fluid osmolality in this segment. Thus, at any point along the loop of Henle, the fluid in the ascending limb has an osmolality less than the fluid in the adjacent descending limb. This osmotic difference was termed the single effect. Because of the countercurrent flow of the tubular fluid in the descending and ascending limbs, this single effect could be multiplied, resulting in an osmotic gradient within the medullary interstitium, where the tip of the papilla has an osmolality of 1200 milliosmoles per kg water, compared to 300 milliosmoles per kg water, at the cortical medullary junction. Countercurrent multiplication will build up a gradient of osmolarity in the interstitial fluid through a repeating two-step process. The first step is called the single effect, and the second step is the flow of the tubular fluid. The single effect. The single effect refers to the function of the thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle. In the thick ascending limb, Sodium chloride is reabsorbed via the sodium-potassium 2-chloride co-transporter. Because the thick ascending limb is impermeable to water, water is not reabsorbed along with sodium chloride, thereby diluting the tubular fluid in the ascending limb. The sodium chloride, which is transported out of the thick ascending limb, enters the interstitial fluid, thereby increasing its osmolarity. Since the descending limb is permeable to water, water flows out of the descending limb until its osmolarity increases to the level of the adjacent interstitial fluid. Thus, as a result of the single effect, the osmolarity of the ascending limb decreases. ADH increases the activity of the sodium-potassium 2-chloride co-transporter and therefore enhances the single effect. For example, in conditions where circulating levels of ADH are high, like in the case of dehydration, or in cases of syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion, the cortico-papillary osmotic gradient is augmented. Flow of tubular fluid. Since the glomerular filtration is an ongoing process, fluid flows continuously through the nephron. As new fluid enters the descending limb, from the proximal tubule, an equal volume of fluid must leave the ascending limb and enter the distal tubule. The new fluid that enters the descending limb will have an osmolarity of 300 milliosmoles per liter since it has come from the proximal tubule. At the same time, the high osmolarity fluid in the descending limb created by the single effect is pushed down towards the bend of the loop of Henle. Again, in the initial state, the loop of Henle and the surrounding interstitial fluid have no cortico-papillary osmotic gradient. Now let's discuss about the steps involved in creating the gradient. Step 1 is the single effect. As sodium chloride is reabsorbed out of the ascending limb and deposited in the surrounding interstitial fluid, water is left behind in the ascending limb. As a result, the interstitial fluid osmolarity increases to 400 milliosmoles per liter and the fluid in the ascending limb becomes much more dilute 
and is diluted to 200 milliosmoles per liter. Fluid in the descending limb equilibrates with the interstitial fluid and its osmolarity also becomes 400 milliosmoles per liter. Step 2 is the flow of fluid. New fluid with an osmolarity of 300 milliosmoles per liter enters the descending limb from the proximal tubule. As a result of this fluid shift, the high osmolarity fluid in the descending limb is pushed further downwards to the bend of the loop of Henle, and an equal volume of fluid is displaced from the ascending limb. Even at this early stage, you can see that the cortico-papillary osmotic gradient is now beginning to develop. Step 3 is the single effect again. Sodium chloride is reabsorbed out of the ascending limb and deposited in the interstitial fluid and water remains behind in the ascending limb. The osmolarity of the interstitial fluid and descending limb fluid increases, adding to the gradient that was established in the previous steps. The osmolarity of the fluid of the ascending limb decreases further and is becoming much more diluted. Step 4 is the flow of fluid again. New fluid with an osmolarity of 300 milliosmoles per liter enters the descending limb from the proximal tubule. As a result of the fluid shift, the high osmolarity fluid in the descending limb is pushed down towards the bend of the loop of Henle, which displaces fluid from the ascending limb. Thereby, the gradient of osmolarity is now larger than it was in step 2. These two basic steps are repeated until the full cortico-papillary gradient is established. Each repeat of the two steps increases or rather multiplies the gradient. The size of the cortico-papillary osmotic gradient depends on the length of the loop of Henle. In humans, the osmolarity of the interstitial fluid at the bend of the loop of Henle is 1200 milliosmoles per liter, but in species with longer loops of Henle, like in the case of desert rodents, the osmolarity at the bend can be as high as 3000 milliosmoles per liter. Countercurrent exchanger or vasorecta. The vasorecta, the capillary networks that supply blood to the medulla, are highly permeable to solute and water. As with the loop of Henle, the vasorecta form a parallel set of hairpin loops within the medulla. Not only do the vasorecta bring nutrients and oxygen to the medullary nephron segments, but more importantly, they also remove the excess water and solute that is continuously added to the medullary interstitium by these nephron segments. Only 5% of the renal blood flow serves and blood flow through the vasorecta is especially low. The ability of the vasorecta to maintain the medullary interstitial gradient is flow dependent. A substantial increase in vasorecta blood flow dissipates the medullary gradient, that is, it washes out the osmoles from the medullary interstitium. Alternatively, reduced blood flow reduces oxygen delivery to the nephron segments within the medulla because transport of salt and other solutes require oxygen and ATP, reduced medullary blood flow decreases the salt and solute transport by the nephron segments in the medulla. As a result, the medullary interstitial osmotic gradient cannot be maintained. Urea recycling. Urea recycling from the inner medullary collecting ducts is the second process that contributes to the establishment of the cortico-papillary osmotic gradient. Urea transport is mediated by urea transporters, presumably by facilitated diffusion. There are at least four isoforms of the transport protein, urea transporter alpha, in the kidneys, namely urea transporter alpha-1 to urea transporter alpha-4. UT beta is found in erythrocytes and in the descending limbs of the vasorecta. Urea transport in the collecting duct is mediated by urea transport alpha-1 and urea transport alpha-3, and both are regulated by vasopressin. As you can see here in the schematic, in the cortical and outer medullary collecting ducts, the ADH increases water permeability, but it does not increase urea permeability. As a result, water is reabsorbed from the cortical and outer 
medullary collecting ducts, but urea remains behind in the tubular fluid. This differential effect of the ADH on water and urea permeability in cortical and outer medullary collecting ducts causes the urea concentration of the tubular fluid to rise. In the inner medullary collecting ducts, the ADH increases water permeability and it increases the transporter for facilitated diffusion of urea, the urea transport 1. This is in contrast to its effect on only water permeability in cortical and outer medullary collecting ducts. Since the urea concentration of the tubular fluid has been elevated by reabsorption of water in the cortical and outer medullary collecting ducts, a large concentration gradient now has been created for urea. In the presence of ADH, the inner medullary collecting ducts can transport urea and urea diffuses down its concentration gradient into the interstitial fluid. Urea that would have otherwise been excreted is now recycled into the inner medulla where it is added to the cortical papillary osmotic gradient. As implied in the mechanism, urea recycling also depends on ADH. When ADH levels are high, as in water deprivation, the differential permeability effects occur and urea is recycled into the inner medulla, adding to the cortical papillary osmotic gradient. When ADH levels are low, as in water drinking or in central diabetes insipidus, the differential permeability effects do not occur and urea is not recycled. The positive effect of ADH on urea recycling is the second mechanism by which ADH augments the cortical papillary osmotic gradient. The first being stimulation of the sodium potassium 2 chloride cotransporter and the single effect of the countercurrent multiplication. Thus, the cortical papillary osmotic gradient is larger when ADH levels are high, like in the case of water deprivation or SIADH than when the ADH levels are low, like in the case of water drinking or central diabetes insipidus. Urea handling in the nephron. In the proximal tubule, 50% of the filtered urea is reabsorbed by simple diffusion. As water is reabsorbed in the proximal tubule, urea lags slightly behind, causing the urea concentration in the tubular lumen to become slightly higher than the urea concentration in the blood. This concentration difference then drives passive urea reabsorption. At the end of the proximal tubule, 50% of the filtered urea has now been reabsorbed, thus 50% remains in the lumen. There is a high concentration of urea in the interstitial fluid of the inner medulla. The thin descending limb of the loop of Henle passes through the inner medulla and urea diffuses from high concentration in the interstitial fluid into the lumen of the nephron. More urea is secreted into the thin descending limbs than was reabsorbed in the proximal tubule. Thus, at the bend of the loop of Henle, about 110% of the filtered load of urea is now present. The thick ascending limb of the loop of Henle, distal tubule, and the cortical and outer medullary collecting ducts are impermeable to urea Thus, no urea transport occurs in these segments. However, in the presence of ADH, water is reabsorbed in the late distal tubule and the cortical and outer medullary collecting ducts. Consequently, in these segments, urea is left behind and the concentration of urea in the tubular fluid becomes quite high. In the inner medullary collecting ducts, there is a specific transporter for facilitated diffusion of urea, named the urea transporter 1. This is activated by ADH, and in the presence of ADH, urea is reabsorbed by this UT1 transporter, moving down its concentration gradient from the lumen into the interstitial fluid of the inner medulla. In the presence of ADH, approximately 70% of the filtered urea is reabsorbed by UT1, leaving 40% of the filtered urea to be excreted in the urine. The urea that is reabsorbed in the inner medulla contributes to the 
Cortico papillary osmotic gradient in a process called urea recycling.